Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to Global Virtual Morning Report. Uh, I'm Vale. I'm, Bale. Uh, I'm from Lima, Peru. And it, today is my first time facilitating Global VMR. I'm super excited to be here with you all, hopefully discussing a case. And please, if you have a case, uh, share it in the chat. We would love to hear from you. And uh, if you don't know, Global VMR is different than um, weekday VMR because we highlight the comments in the chat, and so we don't really need to discuss them, but we will ask you, if you can, to share your thoughts, to open your mic, and as the and to also um, ask maybe to say something in your language, and that way kind of know more diversity around the community that is CP Solvers. And so I would like to start by introducing the team, because we have a global team too, and I am from Peru. Um, so I will ask the rest of the team to say something funny or interesting about themselves in their own language. So I will say that something funny about me is that yo nací el mismo día y la misma hora que Gabriel y somos mejores amigos. Así que es, um, es muy destino. So I will pass the mic to Gabriel to share, uh, to introduce himself and share something funny. Hi everyone, my name is Gabriel. I'm from also Lima, Peru. And as Vale said, we were born in the same day and approximately in the same time. So we were like twins. And I'm very happy to be here today with you guys. I enjoy all the PMRs and I think it's a great, great way to connect with medical students interested in learning around the, around the globe. Um, algo, algo gracioso eh, sobre mí es que la vez pasada estuve en un velero y, y vomité porque no, no estoy muy acostumbrado a, a navegar. Eh, and I pass the mic to Jime. Hi. Fun with you too. I can't believe I lost twins. Um, my name is Maria and something funny about me. Veleros, fui a pescar por primera vez con mis hermanos. Yo no pesco, yo no soy aventurera, eh, pero, pero bueno, eh, nos fuimos y como que me tomé una cerveza y en el mar tope al doble, me quedé y me pegué la quemada de mi vida, todavía estoy quemada, pasé roja toda como seis meses. Entonces, no sé si quieres eh, ir tú. Sorry, Sihime, we didn't hear who you were. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Next. Kiara, do you want to go next? Hey, of course. So I'm Kiara. I'm from Peru, too. I don't know if you can hear me well. I cannot speak too well because I'm right now in a medical center. Um, but I'm so happy to see you today. And some funny thing for today. Um, algo curioso de hoy es que estoy en un turno de medicina interna en La Punta, justo súper cerca a Valeria, entonces como que siento que, que puedo hablar y ella me podría escuchar porque en verdad estamos muy, muy cerca hoy día. Y bueno, no sé si... Uh, Rafa, can you go next? Um, hi everyone, uh, so my name is Rafael and uh, my last year medical students here from Brazil. And a funny fact about me, I'll share that in English because uh, Ravi is going to be kind of mad with me because today was the final of the, the, so um, the soccer team in Brazil actually got a gold medal here in Brazil uh, in the Olympics and I was not watching that. <laughs> I was watching the finals for the volleyball indoors between France and Russia. <laughs> And I think he would be very pleased to know about that. <laughs> so pass the mic now to um, who, who else? I don't think. Oh, Kirito. Yes. Hello. Good morning, everyone. So excited to be here. And today we have, you know, full Peru team. We have Valeria, we have Kiara, and we have Gabriel. So it's going to be awesome. And for funny thing, I just wanted to say that since a few days back, the Ravi was eating carrot. So today I thought, let's wear an orange shirt. And today I'm wearing orange shirt. So yeah, the plan worked. It's orange team today. And thank you, Franco, for volunteering to present the case. And maybe now, uh, Rabi, you want to share some thoughts? I would love some Anne-Marie wisdom on this Saturday first. Anne-Marie, hello. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm so excited about Global VMR. Sadly, I do not speak another language, but I love hearing all the different languages highlighted. I. I'm trying to think of a funny fact about myself. Um, well, 
During the pandemic, I impulse bought rollerblades to take up rollerblading. I haven't been doing it as much lately, though, but um, that was kind of like a pandemic impulse buy. So there's that. And I am so excited to hear a Franco case today. You know, it's uh, Valerie's first time uh, presenting, uh, facilitating today. And I think, uh, as you wouldn't be surprised, she probably is a little bit nervous. So show her some love when you can. And... Um, um, and and to make um, to make this even more fun for everybody, please 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 volunteer in the chat, share your thoughts, and share them out loud. We all are we all are doing this to learn and grow and to take care of patients better. And so the more voices, the more minds, the better we all are. Um, my fun fact is that um, I'm from Lebanon, and in Lebanon, um, um, for folks who are born on April 21st, which is um, for some reason in my town, at least, considered the first day of spring. So my name actually is the word spring, Rabia, means spring, not the mechanical device, but rather the season. And so um, if you noticed, it's actually a very common Middle Eastern name, and you can maybe not place a strong bet, but a mild bet that um, their birthday might be on April 21st. So that's my cultural fun fact for the day. All right, well, I'll give the mic back to you. Thank you so much, Rory and everyone for introducing themselves. So we have a case from Franco. Really great to have you here. Maybe you can introduce yourself first and then we can get it started. Hi everyone, my name is Franco. I'm also from Peru. So I think Peru team is, <laughs> is up today. Um, something funny that can ha that happened to me. Well, I love, I already told you that I, pl I love playing board games. We were playing some board games with my family. It was kind of a sort of a Pictionary board game. And my little sister makes something really funny. Uh, she uh, needs, she, the game told her that she needs to draw the, the Stocks building. And in Spanish is uh, Edificio de la Bolsa. So she literally uh, draw a building and a bag. And she didn't put anything of the fin financial thing of the stocks market or anything of that. So it was so funny to do that. <laughs> that's hilarious. And yeah, that's, that's um, the language barriers in those type of games. <laughs> you can imagine it's hard. So uh, Franco, we would love to hear your case. You always present amazing cases and please everyone share your thoughts in the chat and we will ask you to uh, uh, share them in, in the mic. and. And yeah, let's get it started. Great. So for the chief concerns, we have a 18 year old male with alopecia and bilateral leg edema. It's okay to stop there or do you want me a little more about the history? Uh, sorry, Franco, did you say dyspnea or? No, al alopecia, okay. alopecia okay. and bilateral leg, leg edema. 18, okay. 18, it's an oh. 18, not 80. Okay, that changes everything. So yeah, we have um, a quite, I, I guess, um, recurrent symptom here in BMR, like bilateral, uh, you mentioned bilateral edema or bilateral? Yeah, bilateral. Bilateral, bilateral leg, okay. yeah. Leg, okay. And then we have alopecia, with I, which I don't really have any schema for, so. Anyone on the chat will want to share how they approach edema, bilateral edema. Um, thinking about maybe the three kind of big buckets that always Ravi mentions, thinking about the heart, thinking about the kidneys and thinking about um, the liver as possible etiologies, just to start with bilateral leg edema, something like heart failure, uh, but then the age of the patient maybe not so my first thought, um, then something affecting the kidney, like uh, primary glomerulonephritis. Um, but how about alopecia? I hear, or I see a lot of, um, Tiago, you were mentioning about the importance of some of the characteristics of the alopecia. Maybe you can share more of your thoughts. Oh yeah, thank you, Vale. So um, if the alopecia is like mine, then you have to, to worry about a, uh, a release and syndrome. So uh, as an endocrinologist, this is my field. So if it is like mine, and then there is associated symptoms like hair, hair in the face, 
changing the voice, changing the muscle, muscle then you have to think uh, about uh, hyperandrogenic syndromes. Uh, but as I think Gabrielle has more insight regarding other causes, uh, because it's just one of the, the causes, and there are many causes for alopecia. Thank you, Tiago. It's always great to have your um, endocrinology point of view. And Gabriel, you were, also, you were also thinking about causes of alopecia. Maybe you can share them with us. Yeah, I actually don't know very much about alopecia, but I was thinking maybe this could be, it, it's very important to evaluate the pattern because if it's like a circular pattern, we could start thinking about tinea that is caused by some fungal, the dermatophytes. And I think it's the most common cause of a well-defined alopecia in a young patient. And maybe this could, um, but I don't think this could have a connection with bilateral leg edemia. Uh, I was started thinking about, as Thiago said, the hydrotestosterone excess because the hydrotestosterone is a hormone that produces alopecia in, in older adults, in, in older uh, adults with, of, with uh, masculine sex. And um, I think that's it. Maybe we could start thinking about hypothyroidism because in hypothyroidism, you could have edema bilaterally and hair loss. I love the idea of thyroid problems. And actually Harold was also, also mentioning them in the chat. Harold, um, good morning. Really great to have you here. Where are you tuning from? Hi, how are you? I'm Harold. Uh, I'm from Dominican Republic. Uh, I, um, I, 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 I'm not that funny, so I don't have any fun facts. Um, I was thinking of thyroid, uh, just because, you know, because you, you had already mentioned liver, heart and, uh, uh, the kidneys. So the, the alopecia is something that can be accompanied by, you know, thyroid disease, uh, with the lower extremity edema. We haven't heard the physical exam, but, uh, certainly in a young person, um, I will keep in the back of my mind. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. And really great to have you here. Um, is it your first time in global BMR or in BMR in general? Yes, indeed. Great. Hope to see you. Uh, maybe next time you can present the case or maybe discuss. We'd we'll love sure. to hear your thoughts. Be my pleasure. Great. So I'm also seeing in the chat that Kushal was thinking about fungal infections. And as I love uh, infectious diseases, of course, I'm going to give you the mic. <laughs> to share your wisdom with us, if you can, obviously. Oh, okay. So Kushal can't um, talk right now, but uh, was mentioning in the chat, and just to highlight this comment, that the possibility, if the patient had a past fungal infection, that we could rule out with the past medical history, and was taking itraconazole, this could lead to cardiomyopathy, and this could explain also the edema. So maybe thinking what came first, um, we will probably uh, think more about the possibility or not. And so, um, Rafael, you were also thinking about androgenic alopecia in this what, how do you make the link with the age of the patient? Uh, I know that uh, androgenic alopecia is very common in this kind of age. Uh, it starts in this age and it is usually due to the, uh, Tiago, you can correct me if I'm wrong, if I'm wrong, but I think it's uh, due to the uh, dihydrotestosterone di that is excessive the testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, then you have to, to use finasteride to like manage the this kind of alopecia. Mm. Yeah, I think uh, Rafael was uh, making you that question. Uh, yeah, so uh, I'm sorry for, because when I, 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 I spoke, I, I suppose it wasn't, 80 year old female but actually it's an 18 year old male so it is normal in most cases are are hereditary so uh dehydrotestosterone yes it affects the the, the hair but uh when you, ha you have this androgenetic pattern in a young male if it is the same way it is my pattern then you should not worry about it but there are many other patterns 
in this young man that we should worry about, especially you know, autoimmune disease or infectious disease, as so was already mentioned. Uh, but you no, know, most males that when they lose the hair, like mine again, it's it's not a disease. It's a, a under genetic pattern at this age. But you can treat with finasteride, and uh, uh, then yeah, it, it's true. It will decrease the dehydrotestosterone, and it will make it better. Uh, so that's what I have to say. Thank you so much, Theo, for sharing your thoughts. Yeah, so um, we had an amazing discussion about the causes of alopecia. Maybe someone, like I think Kiara was mentioning, just to link both bilateral edema and alopecia together. Um, what were your thoughts? Hey, well, I don't know so a lot about alopecia, so I can just talk about edema. Um, and my association with alopecia, maybe is that once I, I see a patient, that his presentation was with lower extremity edema and um, plural fusion, and he had like patchy alopecia, alopecia. And so finally he had a uh, lupus. So as this is a young male, I am thinking about that. Also lupus or any autoimmune disease is gonna be more common in female. However, we cannot rule out this. Great thought. Yes, so now that we have uh, talked a little bit about the chief concern of the patient, maybe, uh, Franco, you can give it us a little bit more about the present history. Yeah, <clears throat> okay. So this patient was being following by, by what has been followed by dermatology due to patchy alopecia in the scalp with eyebrows involvement for three months. On an outpatient appointment, uh, he also stated that he had a three-day history of progressive lower extremity edema and occasionally foamy urine for two days. He, he refers that his shoes doesn't fit anymore. Uh, he denies any other, any other symptoms referred to the, to the urine, but he also said that uh, two weeks prior, he kind of had a runny nose and a mild cough that were self-limited and only lasted for one day. Regarding his previous medical history, he had a pulmonary tuberculosis at the age of two, and he is currently with the diagnosis of areata alopecia two months prior, three months prior to his onset of disease. Regarding his medication, he is on topical steroids for the alopecia no family history and no social history. Thank you so much, Franco. I'm just gonna say that I love this case. Oh, sorry, Gabriel, you were gonna say something? Sorry, Franco, didn't catch about uh, hearing loss. I think you you said something like that. No, no, I didn't say anything about hearing loss. Okay, about the earring, I think, something. No, 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 only the foamy earring and that his shoes doesn't fit anymore. Oh, thank you. She, oh, oh, okay, he got uh, the runny nose. He got uh, two weeks prior to the sunset, he got a uh, runny nose and a uh, mild cough that were self-limited. They only last for two days. Thank you so much. Yeah, and, and I think Gabriel, you were uh, confusing hearing with urine, like foamy urine. Um, and I love this, this because I feel like um, we could make maybe a differential from the fact that his shoes don't fit. Like, um, could this be from the edema or could this be from something like an endocrinopathy? And I see hands in the, on the chat making uh, a lot of good hypotheses about what could explain his shoes not fitting and also some other of his symptoms. Hans, could you um, maybe share with us what you're thinking? Yes, when I heard um, hair loss and uh, the shoes no longer fit, I was wondering whether alo whether acromegaly could cause alopecia. And I was just Googling on another computer and there seems to be an association. So that was one thought that came to my mind. And then of course, um, this alopecia it could also be uh, autoimmune. And then of course he had a, a runny nose. So I was even thinking maybe he had a nephritic problem as well, ITA associated nephritic problem secondary to a 
cold or viral infection, but at this point it's all open. Thank you so much, Hans. And as Emery was sharing in the chat, autoimmune diseases can predispose to other autoimmune diseases. So we can really um, not rule out the possibility that this could be something like we were thinking on the start, um, like hypothyroidism that as well as syphilis usually has this pattern of um, hair loss on the eyebrows and maybe the infectious uh, history that Hans was talking about could also explain like another thing that is causing some kidney compromise and with that um, the foamy urine. And so I also see Wallace in the chat and it's also a new face in Global BMR. Hello Wallace, where are you um, talking us from? Hello, I'm, I'm calling from Brazil. It's, it's been a while since I, I haven't uh, participated in a VMR sessions, but it's uh, amazing to be with you guys again. Thank you. Great to have you here, Wallace. Um, and well, you're from the Brazil uh, team. Um, we are uh, a lot of a lot of Brazilians in our team as well. And so, maybe you can share your thoughts. Uh, you were mentioning on the on the chat about the possibility of acromegaly, and maybe share them in Portuguese if you can. Okay. Um, so uh, when Hans talked about uh, the acromegaly, I I was already thinking about the coromegaly, especially because of the shoes that uh, didn't fit anymore. And of course, leg edema can cause that. But I remembered uh, in an outpatient setting, a professor of mine uh, interviewing a patient with uh, a coromegaly in which the magic question was, have you, have you had to change the size of your uh, marriage ring, and then the, the old lady, she says, uh, she said, yes. So it is a, a common complaint. That's my, my thought about. E, então, o que eu estava comentando é que eu estava no ambulatório com um professor de uh, neuro, neuroendocrinologia, em que, a gente, em que se, basicamente tumores de pituitária e tudo mais, e aí tinha uma senhora em que o meu professor chegou e ele fez a pergunta para ela, uh, além de ver, ah, então, o fenótipo da acromegalia, ele perguntou se ela não notou que o anel do casamento dela ficou apertado e ela teve que trocar. E aí ela comentou que sim. E aí ele explicou para nós ah, em relação ao crescimento dos, dos ossos, que é uma causa, que é uma manifestação comum de acromegalia. Então seria isso. Thank you very much. Muito obrigada, Wallace. My português is not that good, but great to hear from you. And, well, I think this is a great point to maybe hear some reflection from Ravi. Uh, what are you thinking and are we in the right path? <laughs> what are your thoughts? My, um, if I'm being authentic about my thoughts, I would love for folks to take a minute and see how um, incredible of a job you're doing. And she's doing this for the first time and it's like she's been doing it for the last 50 years. It's absolutely incredible. So seamless and smooth. Thank you so much, Vale. Um, my thoughts about the case are, I, I'm very intrigued about this case. I think um, I'll just, I have nothing to add to the wonderful differential that people are coming up for alopecia, but I have a piece of advice. And that piece of advice is to not think about alopecia until you've answered two questions. And these have actually come, one of them has come up in the chat for sure, which is you should think about alopecia in two different categories if it's focal or diffuse. Focal alopecia is very different than diffuse alopecia. So just if you label the problem, um, I wouldn't start to solve the problem of alopecia until I know, which I will do instantly by one gaze at the patient if it's focal or diffuse. And then here's the other key question. The other key question on exam is, is this scarring alopecia or non-scarring alopecia? And because the differential diagnosis of scarring alopecia, meaning there's a scar, is very limited, basically down to discoid lupus and a rare but important condition called lichen plan, uh, papularis. So it doesn't, you don't need to know this, but don't try to think about alopecia until you know one, focal or diffuse, and two, scarring or non-scarring. And when you answer those two questions, the, the approach becomes much more manageable than the long list um, than it otherwise would be. Um, and then my advice about lower extremity edema, whenever a patient has lower extremity edema, the goal is to look up because you're gonna be distracted by the legs, but you have to study the rest of the body for clues. And it's not 
um, uncommon that when you look up and you see tachypnea and elevated neck veins, you make the diagnosis of heart failure right then and there, and then you prove it with labs and close exam. It's not uncommon that you look up and you see subtle jaundice and a distended belly and you make the diagnosis of liver disease. And so here you might say, okay, I looked up, at least based on the patient's words, I haven't laid eyes on the patient yet, and there's no hint of respiratory involvement, and there's no hint of jaundice or ascites. And that, when you layer it in with the fact that the patient's making foamy urine, you're wondering, is this some sort of kidney disease? And, you know, we can think um, more and more and more about what kidney disease can happen in the setting of alopecia, what kidney disease can happen in the setting of a URI. And, but that would be um, a lot of fun, but probably not something you're doing in real life. In real life, you're getting more and more data. So to summarize, break down alopecia into focal versus diffuse, scarring versus non-scarring. Two key questions will help you make a lot of progress. And then when you have lower extremity edema, look up. If you see something, it's probably heart or liver. If you see nothing, prioritize the kidney. All righty, back to you, Ravi. Thank you so much, Ravi. And yeah, I love the idea of your approach to alopecia and definitely we'll review it later. And I'm seeing in the chat that also Mary was thinking about a way that we could connect the alopecia with the urine findings and the edema. Maybe you can share your thoughts, Mario, and how could this be presented in this patient? Yes, hi. Um, well, I think a possible link uh, between the, those two manifestations is uh, uh, lupus because uh, a typical cause of of alopecia in patients with lupus is discoid lupus and 15 to 30 percent of patients with discoid lupus that it's a type of subacute sub uh, um, cutaneous lupus is associated with SLE and SLE can cause edema mainly through lupus nephritis especially type 5 that's uh, usually more of a nephrotic syndrome than a than a nephritic syndrome Yeah, thank you so much, Mario. Definitely a possibility that I could link all the symptoms together. And maybe this could be a case of two things going on at the same time. Or um, so I would like to know maybe, I don't know if Franco, you have this information that the alopecia, how long ago has been a, an issue for this patient? Three months. It was like it came out, came out of nothing for, for three months, and it is a non scarring. Okay, that's great. So we can maybe um, approach it through Ravi's um, uh, schema of non-scaring alopecia, but also I think, um, I don't know if that changes our differential much, just because this could maybe be a post-infectious nephritis on top of an alopecia, or maybe something autoimmune like Mario was hinting that was just progressing and presenting first with alopecia and then with the kidney involvement. And so maybe you can give us a little bit more about the physical exam and then we can um, still uh, highlight, highlight the comments in the chat. Yeah, sure. So the temperature was 37.4 Celsius, heart rate of 92, blood pressure of 110 over 70, respiratory rate of 18, SpO2 of 98 on room air, her height was 1.7 meters. The weight was 81 kilos. He said that it was an increase of eight kilos from her prior, for, her, for his regular weight. Uh, generally, he didn't look ill appearing. There was some kind of mild pallor. And he had uh, generalized edema. For HEENT, there were multiple patches of alopecia on the scalp, no eyebrows, no oral ulcers, cracky lips, free palpable, non painful, non hard cervical lymph nodes of about one by two centimeters. Cardiovascular, it was, it was okay, no, between the normal no contributory. Pulmonary, there were bilateral crackles on both lungs with predominance on the basis. Regarding abdomen, it was a distended abdomen without tenderness to palpation, no gording, no rebound, no masses, no organomegaly. The bubble zones were present and uh, he had a positive 
fluid wave test. Neuro was unremarkable and there were no rashes. Thank you so much, Franco. So we have an increase of eight kilos, and this is was uh, what was the time course of this weight increase? You didn't quite know. It's presumed to be like one month or less. Okay, okay. So maybe not so fitting with a three-day history of edema, as he kind of uh, attributed the weight increase to. So what are we thinking with this uh, history of? weight uh, gain and also the, pres the presence of ascites. Um, how does this change our approach to edema? And I was also um, thinking that this patient has palpable cervical nodes and are hard, but they are non-painful. Non -painful. And so, I mean, I don't know, what are you guys thinking? Could this be part of the um, illness script that we are making of this patient, or could this be another thing? Could this be maybe a post-infectious um, etiology just because of the history of the running nose? Maybe not so likely being, um, well, non-painful and hard, but what are your thoughts? And also, I would like to highlight that Anne-Marie was um, thinking or was sharing what I guess is a common diagnosis, telogen effluvium, but things, common things being common, I think it is an important point to reflect. So maybe AMK, you can teach us more about this, uh, this condition. Yeah, so just whenever someone comes in with hair loss, I'm trying to discern, is this a benign cause or is this something that needs to be investigated more? One of the common benign causes is uh, telogen effluvium, which basically is just in stressful situations, our body tries to conserve energy. And one of the ways that it does that is halting hair growth. And so about three months after a stressful situation, you can get kind of this diffuse um, hair loss, but then looking at other features of the case, like loss of hair loss on the eyebrows, um, it being like diffuse and progressive, um, if there's like discrete patterns where there's loss of hair would make this really unlikely, but just something to kind of always keep in the differential when someone says they come in with hair loss, kind of exploring what might have preceded that. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. That's a great point. And also, I love that Rafa was mentioning in the chat because we have been thinking this far about uh, endocrinopathy is causing the edema and also the kidney being the um, key place where this was causing or could explain the symptom, but you were also thinking about the heart. So what makes you think about the possibility? Uh, so I was thinking about the heart because of the lung abnormalities that we're seeing on the physical exam with bilateral crackles. So and bilateral basilar crackles that points me towards the heart. So I would be curious to know uh, if this patient also has like elevated GVP or maybe abdominal distension and it just ended actually. So yeah, so maybe it is something that points towards the heart. And also he, this patient has a positive fluid weight test. So it means that maybe he has a situs and that also could point towards the heart, like a cardiac cirrhosis. Yeah, definitely. So we are, I think on a case of anasarca with when there's, I don't know if that's how you say it in English, but at least in Spanish, um, so generalized edema. And I love that you were thinking about the heart because of the lung com uh, being compromised in this case. And I also love the thought about, of Nilayan, about the possibility of this being a malignancy. What are your thoughts on Nilayan? You always have something really amazing to say on the chat. So really great to hear from you. So I thought of uh, GI malignancy because I uh, saw these three uh, painless of cervical lymph nodes. And that made me think of trisia lymph node and how GI malignancies can present with um, cervical uh, lymphadenopathy. And then um, GI malignancies uh, have been known to cause um, membranous or MPGN that can present with a necrotic syndrome like picture. And uh, the fact that we had foamy urine uh, maybe points towards that. Uh, but then we have to explain how a cancer can cause alopecia. And uh, that part I'm totally guessing if, for example, this alopecia can be autoimmune alopecia. So maybe we can connect it that way, but uh, I still can't connect a cancer with um, the bi-basal crackles. 
Thank you so much, Nilayan. We are just burdening our differential at this point, thinking about causes like malignancy, something affecting the heart, something affecting uh, the kidney, something autoimmune, and not really know the possibility of something post-infectious also contributing to the presentation of this patient. So, Franco, maybe you can give us a, uh, some of the labs and we can continue. Yeah, great. So, um, he, regarding CBC, uh, the hemoglobin was on 15.3, MCV 93, MCH 29. Leukocytes were on 7,620, platelets on 400,000. Regarding some of the metabolic panel, the creatinine was on 0.57, UN on 28, sodium 133, potassium 4.2, chloride 98, uh, we also had a ure, uh, UA with a pH of 6, density of 1.015, no cells, not red blood cast, no red blood cells, no cast, but the dipsticks show a uh, high protein, like the highest you can possibly ever see. <laughs> and the, um, I will also, oh, they, ECR, the erythrocyte sedimentation rate was high on 94. The C-reactive protein was also high on 1.35. The normal values of the lab are 0.5. Uh, I think we can stop there or maybe I can give you a little more. What do you think? Um, what works best for you, Franco? I trust you. So. Um, if you think this I is think, a great place to stop. Yeah, I think we can kind of move on to, okay, the total cholesterol was 390, normal triglyceride, triglyceride 93, the LDL was really high, 311, the HLD, HDL was 60, also high. Um, I think we can stop there. That's great. So we have uh, what seems like a nephrotic syndrome for the high protein on the UA, but also um, the high cholesterol, and high LDL, which, which I think could maybe um, also be part of the nephrotic syndrome presentation of this patient. And I love that um, on the chat, and Marie was thinking about TB as a possibility. And I love that idea because I was also thinking about it, but as I always kind of think about TB and it's quite um, a common diagnosis here, I didn't want to like be um, or anchor on that, but um, I'm surprised Kushal hadn't mentioned it before. So what are you thinking, and Marie, could this be TB? <laughs> That's that's a hard call. I mean, I think our kind of decision point here that I'm thinking about is I'm thinking about nephrotic syndrome, but, you know, thinking about what's driving it. So I'm thinking about a primary nephrotic syndrome versus a secondary um, nephrotic syndrome. So definitely getting more history, um, testing kind of the low hanging HIV hepatitis um, panels, and then testing syphilis. But then I'm also thinking about kind of like TB and then autoimmune diseases driving it. So that was just kind of something I had in the back of my mind is based on where the patient lives if this could be tuberculosis, but the differential is certainly broad now. Yeah, definitely. So thinking about causes of nephrotic syndrome um, on a patient HIV positive, I think uh, focal nephrotic syndrome will be, or focal, I don't remember the name exactly, of the primary uh, focal diffusing, I think. Um, then, well, maybe not the age of the page, the patient here, but thinking about um, minimum change that also be part of the pediatric presentation and other causes as Mary was thinking. Uh, yeah, Kushal, thank you so much. The collapsing focal sclerosing glomerular uh, um, nephrotic syndrome. And so minimal change, um, what are your other thoughts you have? Um, as Rafa was mentioning also on the chat, the nephrotic symptom could also explain the generalized edema, the ascites, and the lung involvement. But what will be your next steps uh, on this patient? 
And I don't know if maybe we could have a presentation of lymphoma like with a normal uh, hematologic panel. I don't know if that's quite common. And Marie, maybe you can teach us a little bit more about that. <laughs> I'm not a lymphoma expert, but certainly with lymphoma, with like the cervical lymphadenopathy, you know, I think thinking about that um, and it can be associated with a minimal change. And sometimes you can see a relatively like preserved um, hematology panel with lymphoma. So just certainly kind of with infection and autoimmune disease, I'm tracking lymphoma too as part of the differential. Okay, thank you so much. That's a learning point for me. And so um, what are you thinking, Ravi? Uh, maybe it's a good point before we have a little bit more labs that could maybe give us uh, the final diagnosis as well. Um, no, I think it's interesting if you just pause for a moment and watch our thinking, which I have the pleasure of doing. In medicine, it's important to know what stage of the diagnosis journey you're in. And most of the time, for the, until these labs, we were trying to understand the problem, right? We were like, what is the problem? And now we're trying to solve it. You see that difference? The difference was before we were like, there's alopecia, uh, it's an 18 year old, there's TB in the background, there's edema. Now we're saying, what is the cause of this nephrotic syndrome? And if I find the cause in this nephrotic syndrome, I'll probably be able to unravel all of this. And so I, I'm, I, I'm, I caution you to continue to maintain that approach of when you're trying to clarify the problem, don't be tempted to solve it. And now I think you're confident that the question is, what is the cause of this patient's nephrotic syndrome? I think the first thing to recognize is we haven't fully proven this is nephrotic syndrome. What we've proven is that this patient has nephrotic range proteinuria and edema. And the difference remaining is we need to know the albumin to be sure this patient has nephrotic syndrome. And before I used to be like, oh, what's the point? It's gonna be low 100%. The point is that if you know somebody has nephrotic range proteinuria only, the most likely cause is diabetes by far and away, much more common. However, if somebody has full-fledged nephrotic syndrome as defined by edema, a protein to creatinine ratio of greater than 3.5 over 24 hours, ideally, and hypoalbuminemia, suddenly diabetes becomes much less likely because diabetes does not usually result in the full expression of nephrotic syndrome. Um, but I think um, given the amount of protein, you probably would anticipate that the albumin is gonna be low and start to solve this as a nephrotic syndrome. And I think it's important in general to remember that most nephrotic syndrome is primary kidney disease or idiopathic. 80% of all nephrotic syndrome is idiopathic membranous, idiopathic focal segmental glomerulosclerosis or idiopathic minimal change disease. And only a small fraction of patients, about 20%, have it secondary to an identifiable etiology. However, that landscape is changing tremendously with the discovery of phospholipase A2 receptor antibodies, PLA2R. That we have found accounts for the vast majority of idiopathic, previously thought to be idiopathic membranous nephropathy. But the workup still focuses on the 20%. And the 20% I'll share with you is these. A small subset of infections, and syphilis has been mentioned because of the alopecia. The cancer has been mentioned because of the lymphadenopathy, HIV, lupus, and lymphoma. There are some other rare things like amyloidosis and other stuff, but I think the focus now often is, what's the syphilis serology? Is there reason to worry about cancer? What's the ANA and what's the HIV? But a word of caution, the, the, the definition, the, the discovery of a secondary cause does not prove that it results in nephrotic syndrome. 
Most people with syphilis don't have nephrotic syndrome. Most people with lupus still need a biopsy to clarify the nature of it. Most people with HIV don't have nephrotic syndrome. So you still have to do the serological workup, but most people still need a kidney biopsy because the association with all these things and nephrotic syndrome is true, but often can, they can be innocent bystanders to the disease process. So nephrotic syndrome is very complicated. The first point is what's the difference between proteinuria and, and syndrome? It's the prevalence of diabetes. The second point is most nephrotic syndrome is primary idiopathic, about 80%. And these antibodies are changing the game for primary membranous. Most people with nephrotic syndrome need a biopsy because the secondary causes while well described may be innocent bystanders in a separate disease process. That's where I'm at. I think the serology is next, but it's hard to imagine not getting a biopsy in this patient. Thank you, Robert. So maybe that was uh, the next step, Franco. For time, maybe you can give us uh, more information before we anchor our, on our final diagnosis. Yeah, of course. So the albumin was 0 0.89, really low. Uh, all the serology for lupus, he had a, a negative ANA, ANA negative, antiphospholipid negative, Epstein-Barr serology negative, CMV negative, toxoplasma negative, brucellosis, hepatitis, syphilis, all of them came back negative. He also had a serial ova and parasites, uh, stool assay negative. Uh, direct uh, tuberculosis screening in the urine for BK in the urine, feces all came back negative. We also make a lymph node biopsy. We have those lymph nodes. They were negative for malignancy, tuberculosis, or other infectious diseases. He got an X-ray and a CT that showed a calcified left lower love uh, nodule because his prior history with tuberculosis. And we did a bronchoalveolar lavage that was negative for tuberculosis, a gene expert also negative. We practically screened tuberculosis all the way down and rule out all the infectious causes. And we were there. So I think we can we have a little couple of minutes to discuss it before revealing the final key exam. Yes, thank you so much, Franco, for this amazing case. So uh, it seems like the kidney biopsy will give us the answer, but uh, we we have seen a lot of tests that rule out. Um, the, we were thinking about lupus. We were also thinking about secondary causes of uh, glomerular or sorry, um, nephrotic syndrome, like syphilis and tuberculosis, which. Well, I'm not going to say sadly, but <laughs> I'm a little sad that it was not the final diagnosis. Um, and also the lymph biopsy negative for malignancy, definitely reassuring. So what are your thoughts at this point? Could this be a cause of primary or are we missing something ruling out uh, secondary causes? And about the um, antibodies, Yesterday uh, on RLR, if you didn't tune in, I could share a pair of um, that Ravi actually mentioned and was that a negative ANA makes two autoimmune diagnoses less likely if there is um, a, like a low uh, pre-test probability and these two diagnoses are lupus and scleroderma. So with a negative ANA, even though the presentation made us definitely think about lupus and on top of, the, of our differential, um, makes it lower on the, on the list. And so, um, Hans, what are you thinking? Could this be a secondary cause that we haven't thought, or are you anchoring on primary nephrotic syndrome? Looking at all this data, I'm strongly inclined to go with a primary cause for his nephrotic syndrome. So, what we haven't seen is um, a urinalysis telling whether there's any blood in the urine as well, the number of red blood cells, and how much protein, if it is above three milligrams over a full day. But the uh, kidney biopsy, as you mentioned, I think will be very revealing and then we'll find out. But I cannot make any sense with the alopecia at this point, if it is a 
primary. So I need some help in teaching. Yeah, definitely. Um, because with the alopecia, we were thinking, okay, maybe this could be lupus, maybe this could be something in the cream going on. But maybe it is, there are two different things. You know, the time course really um, gave us both possibilities. Could this be a disease progressing primarily from alopecia to kidney involvement, or could this be an alopecia with something like we were thinking, or Rafael was actually hinting on the start, and Tiago as well, of uh, androgen and regulation in this young man, and then a post-infectious or a... Um, a kidney problem occurring independently. Oh, Kirtan, you were thinking about Kimura, and that would definitely be a teaching point for me because I have never heard of that disease. What are your thoughts? Yes, so for the sake of time, I would just say that I just learned it from our CBSOR schema only. I am not sure where I learned it, but I just remember that Kimura disease is something which can happen in young patients, and it is one of those diseases which can present with nephrotic syndrome and also has predilection to sometimes cause alopecia. It's definitely rare, but since we have already ruled out so many infectious causes, I was just thinking that maybe nephrotic syndrome can be linked to it, but you are right. It can be simply minimal chain disease and maybe by looking for two different diagnoses. So now let's see how it goes. Thank you so much for that, Kirtan. We always learn something new from you. So Kimura disease, uh, Kushal is, is sharing some pearls about it. Um, so, uh, Franco, maybe for the sake of time, you can give us a kidney bios biopsy and we can reflect in retrospect about the presentation of this patient. Yeah, okay. So the kidney biopsy show focal and segmental glomerular sclerosis. And there is also a kind of a couple of studies that have case reports that link it alopecia with this disease. Oh, so the alopecia was part of the hormonephritis. I didn't know that. That's a really great pearl. What are your thoughts, Chat? What are your thoughts about this final diagnosis? Oh, and Franco, the patient was HIV negative, right? Yeah, HIV negative, yeah. Okay. And maybe you can share with us how the patient progressed, how was the treatment, how's yeah, he doing now? He he had two recurrences, but he has he has had a, a methylprednisolone for six months in pulses and mofetil, mycophenolate mofetil, and he is currently on three grains of that, and he's doing okay with no proteinuria for three months. That's really great to hear. So this was a case of primary FSC, FSGS um, with alopecia. So I didn't know that that could be a possible presentation. We can have it on our illness script from now on. Thank you so much, Franco, for sharing this case. A lot of learning points. Maybe can, we can hear now from Rafa. And also, um, if you are in speaking or speak Spanish uh, or you have an English program presentation, please put it in the chat so that we can put it on the board as well. So Rafa, we would love to hear from you. Hi everyone. Uh, so thank you Frank for the case, it's really, really interesting. I, I myself didn't know about the association with alopecia and that's something that I will <laughs> carry on with myself. So uh, we had a 80 year, I'm sorry, 18 year old male with alopecia and bilateral leg edema. And then we thought first about the edema and we thought about the kidneys and also about the liver and also about the heart and then an emphatic obstruction. And then the spiral that Ravi always shares with us that we have to look to the patient and see if there is any jaundice to think about the liver, elevated GVP to think about the heart, or maybe an unremarkable physical exam to think about the kidneys. And then we talking about the alopecia, we thought about its focal, is it diffuse, is it scarring, we could think about discarded lupus or non-scarring. And then we talk about the many ideologies with alopecia being the main ones like androgenic alopecia that has this pattern like anterior, mild, temporal, and vert vertex of the skull, hair loss, and also fungal infections, autoimmune diseases, and even medication-induced or stress-induced. And then when it comes to the lung crackles, we 
is not about, um, there are many causes that could lead to that. It's actually basically excessive within the lungs. And we thought we can divide that base into exudates like pneumonia or transudates like CHF, but also nephrotic syndrome. So then when it comes to collecting clues, we thought about the bilateral carcos and the nephrotic range of proteinuria. And also this patient had a sinus. So all of that could be explained by the nephrotic syndrome. And then um, we have to go after the cause of the nephrotic syndrome. And then we thought about minimal change disease, FSGS, but also membrane nephropathy and amyloidosis, which is more rare than the other etiologists. And then finally, which was the diagnosis, we saw that this patient actually have focal segment of glomerular sclerosis. They can be divided into primary and secondary causes. And uh, one of the secondary causes is HIV. So we have to look at the serology of the patient, but also sickle cell disease, heroin abuse, and congenital malformations. So thank you everyone. Uh, do you want to reflect, uh, uh, Valerie, how did you, uh, the session go to you today? Thank you, Rafa. Uh, thank you, everyone, for making facilitating quite easy for me. I, I had a lot of comments from the chat just to uh, collect. And so thank you for making this an amazing experience. And hopefully um, next uh, Saturday we can have, uh, I believe Kiara is going to be facilitating so you can tune in and we can have an amazing time as today. And you can also volunteer to discuss, to uh, present that case. We would love to hear from you. and. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much to the whole team also for their support. Rala, you were absolutely superb. Really, really superb. Um, and Franco, thank you so much for bringing such a wonderful case for us. As you reflect on all these um, wonderful learning points and these great people, now you know you've seen a case of nephrotic syndrome with a normal creatinine. So think about that. Uh, and um, if you don't understand that yet, I think we can talk about it next week, but I don't want you to leave uh, without that very um, interesting and intriguing fact. The kidney is not working, but the creatinine is normal. So uh, we'll definitely reflect on that um, next week. Thank you all for a great, great Saturday. See you then.